Amen. Thank you. Would you please turn your Bibles to the book of Ezekiel, the Old Testament, Ezekiel chapter 12. I'd like for us to read in verse 1 down through verse 16, Ezekiel 12, 1 through 16. And while you're turning there, let me tell you what a joy and a privilege it is to be here at Cedarville University. I'm so thankful to God for the way the Spirit is moving here and propelling uh, this campus, students, alums, faculty, administrators, all over the world and leading the global evangelical movement. And so it's a, it's a privilege to be here. Ezekiel chapter 12, starting with verse one. And since these words are breathed out by the Holy Spirit, come with the exact same authority as if our Lord Jesus were standing here speaking them to us. Would you stand with me out of reverence for the reading of the word of our God? The Holy Spirit says through Ezekiel, The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, you dwell in the midst of a rebellious house who have eyes to see but see not, who have ears to hear but hear not, for they are a rebellious house. As for you, son of man, prepare for yourself an exile's baggage and go into exile by day in their sight. You shall go like an exile from your place to another place in their sight. Perhaps they will understand, though they are a rebellious house. You shall bring out the baggage by day in their sight as baggage by, for exile, and you shall go out yourself at evening in their sight as those who must go into exile. And in their sight, you'll dig through the wall and bring your baggage out through it. In their sight, you shall lift the baggage on your shoulder and carry it out at dusk, and you shall cover your face that you may not see the land, for I have made you a sign for the house of Israel. And I did as I was commanded. I brought out my baggage by day as baggage for exile. And in the evening, I dug through the wall with my own hands. I brought out my baggage at dusk, carrying it on my shoulder in their sight. And in the morning, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, has not the house of Israel, this rebellious house, said to you, what are you doing? Say to them, thus says the Lord God. This oracle concerns the prince in Jerusalem and all the house of Israel who are in it. Say, I am a sign for you. As I have done, so it shall be done to them. They shall go into exile, into captivity, and the prince who is among them shall lift his baggage upon his shoulder at dusk and shall go out, and they shall dig through the wall to bring him out through it, and he shall cover his face that he may not see the land with his eyes, And I will spread my net over them, and he shall be in my snare, and I will bring him to Babylon, the land of the Chaldeans, yet he shall not see it, and he will die there. And I will scatter toward every wind all who are around him, his helpers and all his troops, and I will unsheath the sword after them, and they shall know that I am the Lord when I disperse them among the nations and scatter them among the countries." But I will let a few of them escape from the sword, from famine and pestilence, that they may declare all their abominations among the nations where they go, and may know that I am the Lord. Let's pray. Holy Father, we stand here with your word in front of us. And so, Lord, I pray and ask that you would silence any spirit in this place that might exalt itself above or beside the name of Jesus Christ. Anything within us that is not conformed to the image of Jesus, Lord, would you cut it out of our hearts? Would you instead speak and breathe life into us by your word? And we ask this, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I was talking to a college student recently on a campus who came up and I noticed this was somebody who had been asking a lot of questions, seemed to be sort of a leader uh, in in the campus uh, group uh, there at that university. And she came up to me after and said, can you pray for me because I am right at the breaking point of stress and exhaustion. And so I started talking to her about her studies and about the sort of pressure that uh, comes upon people, especially during college and university uh, time to achieve and to succeed. And she said, no, I'm really not exhausted by my studies. I'm really not exhausted by sort of college life. 
She said, I'm really exhausted by social media. And she said, and, and what's going on with me? She said, I find myself not able to disengage from social media because I'm constantly checking what is on there and what people might be saying about me. And sometimes they're not saying anything about me and I kind of read into that, well, maybe they don't like me. And then if they do say something, I take all the negative things to heart and I don't think about any of the positive things. And then I find myself looking at some of the things that my friends are doing and my peers are doing and constantly wondering, well, why wasn't I invited to that? And why am I missing out on that? And I'm just exhausted. Her situation is not unusual at all. She thought it was, but that is life in 21st century America, a sort of hyper-connected sort of world where everyone is kind of like a politician checking your poll numbers constantly, 24 hours a day, except without an election in sight. That's an exhausting way to live, but it's not really a new problem. Technology makes this happen, but the problem is an old, old fear, and the fear is of exile. You want to belong. You want to have a group. You want to have a, a sense of, of being part of a group of people who approve of you and, and for whom you are one of their own. And every place in American culture is like this, which is why you see so many people just sort of absorbing themselves into mobs whether those are mobs online or whether those are mobs culturally or whether they're mobs in terms of their workplaces, they're, they're finding themselves within this silo of people to say, I need to do whatever you would have me to do in order that I may belong to you. The same thing happens within the church of Jesus Christ. There is that constant message and that constant refrain in every era of the church for the church to conform, as, as Paul says in Romans 12, to conform to the pattern of the world around it or to conform within the church to whatever is blowing through that particular church at the moment. And so there are some people who will find themselves simply looking for a place to belong, and they can do it in any number of ways. There are some people who do that by conforming to the outside culture to such a degree to which they would say, well, we can't talk about the sins that the culture would disapprove us talking about. And we can't talk about those distinctives of Christianity that people would find to be offensive. And then there are other people who conform themselves not to the outside culture. They love the fact that they see themselves as countercultural, but they conform themselves to the Christian subculture in such a way that they say to themselves, we can't mention the sins that happen in here. We can't match, m mention the patterns that happen inside of the people of God. And so in any of these cases, what do you end up with? You end up with a sense of cynicism where the outside world says, is Christianity really just another group of people who are doing exactly the same thing as every other group of people, just huddling up with people who are like them and conforming themselves into a herd? Is Christianity merely a transaction for people who fear being exiled by their group? Well, the book of Ezekiel speaks to that and speaks to that directly. It's a book that can be weird and bleak and scary. You, you typically don't give Ezekiel to somebody to read the week after that person becomes a Christian. You know, start with Ezekiel, and they uh, have uh, flying wheels and bleak uh, visions of judgment and, and wonder what's happening here. As a matter of fact, often when we hear Ezekiel within the church talked about or preached or taught, it's usually in terms of the valley of dry bones. 
in Ezekiel uh, chapter 37, where God speaks breath into dry bones and they live. But you really can't understand the dry bones passage if you don't understand what's going on in the rest of the book of Ezekiel, including what's happening right here in Ezekiel chapter 12. God says to the prophet, this is after he and a large number of people have been ripped out of their country, ripped out of their land, a conquered people, they've been taken to Babylon, they're humiliated, they don't know if they'll ever see their home again, they don't know if they'll ever have a future again, there's been a puppet king put in charge of their old homeland back in Judah, and the future looks terrifying, the future looks bleak, And God says to Ezekiel, what I want you to do is a dramatic enactment. He says, I want you to get up, take a bag, just like you are leaving, just like you are going into exile, put it on your back and do this as a sign for the people around you that exile is coming to the house of God. Now, why is this important? It's important because one of the problems that Ezekiel's dealing with is the problem of people saying, God isn't really going to judge us because God doesn't really see what's going on here. And other people who are concluding, because we are going through this time of judgment, that means that we have no hope and God is completely finished with us. So either undue confidence or undue despair. And in the middle of all of that, God says, I want you to demonstrate to the people around you what it actually means to be an exile. Now, exile language is language that can be a little bit dangerous for Christians. Because sometimes when people say exile, what they really mean is a kind of resentment over the fact that they don't have the same sort of cultural power that maybe they used to have, or they don't have the same sort of influence that maybe they used to have. And sometimes what it can lead to is a kind of siege mentality, a kind of uh, of paranoia that can happen within Christian circles so that you can have some Christians who constantly think that the rest of the world hates them when in reality the rest of the world just doesn't think about them very much at all. And so it can, it can lead to this, and sometimes what it can lead to is a sort of combativeness that can happen on the part of Christians where we're constantly at war with our mission field, constantly at battle with the people around us who don't know Christ, not out of conviction, but because it makes us feel alive, is something that makes it seem as though. It's like bungee jumping. It can give you the sort of adrenal rush as though you're standing up for Christ when in reality, you're just conforming to those same patterns of the world around you just using Christian language. God says to Ezekiel, I want you to take this baggage to be a sign to the rest of the world And it is a sign that looks crazy. He says, the rebellious house around you, they will not understand or know why you are doing this. They will think that you have completely lost your senses. That is always the case. That is always the case. In every era that the word of God has come, When the word of God comes with power, the initial assumption is this must be crazy. As a matter of fact, if you notice, when Jesus is teaching and preaching in the New Testament, every time that Jesus is being received well, he assumes you don't understand what I'm talking about. And so he continues pressing when the crowds are gathered around and they're really eager for the loaves and the fishes, What does Jesus do? He says, unless you chew on my skin and drink my blood, you can have nothing to do with me. And everybody says, eh, this is a creepy cult guy. And they start 
leaving and exiting. And Jesus' own disciples are standing there saying, we finally have a crowd of thousands of people, and what do you do? You get up and talk about cannibalism, and they all leave. Jesus is completely unperturbed by all of that. Why? Because the wisdom of God is fundamentally different from the wisdom of the world. It's a contradiction to all of that. God says to Ezekiel, in order for you to be a blessing to the nation, in order for you to be a blessing to the people, you have to actually look odd to them. It's the very distinctiveness of this sign through which God speaks. But it's easier just to conform because we have fear. And what is the fear? Jesus tells us what it is in John chapter 12. They didn't commit themselves to him because they feared being put out of the synagogue, being put out of the community. Same way every single person has that fear. If I really follow Christ, am I going to be seen as crazy by my parents or by my peer group or by my workplace? or by my future career prospects, or by the culture around me, or by my church. He says, bear this sign of an exile and stand alone in order not to simply be by yourself, but in order to be a blessing then to the community by walking away from them. This is, this is a pressure that often we do not get. And yet none of us would be here if the Apostle Paul had not said in Galatians chapter two, I did not yield to those false teachers that wanted him to conform to the the pattern that they were teaching. I did not yield to them for a minute. Why? So that the gospel will be preserved for you. You have to walk alone often in integrity so that you can be able to maintain a witness for generations to come. There are a lot of people in Christian ministry who are serving in churches where those congregations would say, anybody is welcome to be in our church, to be baptized into our church, to be a member of our church, as long as those people are white. And there were many Christian leaders, many pastors, many Sunday school teachers, many others who knew this is a complete contradiction of what God has taught us in Ephesians chapter 3 and in Galatians chapter 3, and in Genesis chapter 1, and in Revelation chapter 5, and in Revelation chapter 21. But they were fearful of what would happen if they said so. And so what did they do? They sacrificed their own consciences. They sacrificed a part of their own uh, soul in their silence and in their timidity And they sacrificed their ability then to speak and to stand and to bear witness to generations that were to come. It's easy to look back and to say, you can see that sort of cowardice there, but all of us will face that in different ways. Should I simply conform or should I walk away? But notice also, God says when you're showing this sign, you're showing a future that is a future of judgment. God says, I am going to do this to my people. I'm going to leave some of you behind so that you may declare your abominations to the nations. That does not sound like good news. That does not sound like a future of hope. And yet that is exactly the sort of sign that you and I bear right now as the people of Jesus Christ. We are the people who believe in judgment day. 
And that's one of the most offensive things often to the people around us. Often when they think of Christian, they think of judgmental. And sometimes you will have people who they may know no other pastor scripture except judge not lest you judge. And well, you know, I saw one person wearing a shirt, nobody can judge me but Judy. (laughs) But nobody really believes that. Nobody really believes that because all of us have a sense in which we've been wronged and when somebody is harming us and when somebody is defrauding us, we kind of want a Judge Judy there, to put it right. Uh, we, We kind of want a sense of justice that is there. We just don't want it applied to us. The Christian witness is not that Christians are more moral than the people around us. The Christian witness is not that Christians are smarter than the world around us. The Christian witness is that Christians are joined to Jesus Christ. We have been joined to him in judgment, and so we are doing exactly what Ezekiel says that God will do with the people of God. You're going out into the nations not to say, look how much better we are than you, Look at how how superior we are to you, but to declare our abominations. Even in the act of baptism, we are signifying that we are people who are deserving of judgment, but we are people who have already been through judgment. The freedom that comes with that is the sort of freedom that can fuel then mission. I had an older man I was talking to one time thinking about a situation that I had had in my life years before where somebody that I should have ministered to, somebody I should have shown kindness to, I instead was really harsh. And I said things that I wish I hadn't said, that I wish I could take back. And after all of these years, it continued to haunt me And I talked to this older man. I said, I just wish that I had done something differently and I'm trying to find a way to make that right. And he said to me, let's suppose, let's suppose that your reading of this is right and let's put the worst possible spin on it that we we can. And let's suppose that that person that you spoke to so harshly never forgives you for it. What then? What then? He said, your problem is pride. He said, because you are assuming somehow that when you stand before God, you will have fixed all of the mistakes that you have made. You will have resolved all of those hanging narrative threads that you have rather than recognizing at the heart level what you already know at the brain level which is that you are standing before God with nothing but Jesus Christ. The fearfulness that comes with us, the fearfulness that we have of getting out of step with whatever group that we find ourselves in, that fear comes from the fact that we want to be protected and we want to be protected in a herd. But if we have born the sign of judgment, if we have already been through judgment, we have nothing to fear. There is nothing that can happen to you in the future that is anything compared to what you've already been through. Worst thing that can happen to you is not your parents refusing to speak to you again. Worst thing that can happen to you is not failing out of your degree program. Worst thing that can happen to you is not having that relationship break up and being alone. Worst thing that can happen to you is not being in a car accident or getting cancer. The worst thing that can happen to you is dying under the judgment of God outside the gates of Jerusalem, and that has already happened. If you are in Christ, that has 
already happened to you so that when God sees you and when God views you, he does not see you in terms of a list of all of your sins and all of your failures and all of your inadequacies, and yet you found a loophole into into his presence. He sees you united and joined to Jesus Christ, so he thinks of you exactly as he thinks of Jesus. This is my beloved child in whom I am well pleased. We need not then live out lives seeking to find the approval of people. Because we are the people of the cross. We are strangers and exiles in every era, strangers and exiles in every place. And we do not need to protect ourselves from being hurt. We do not need to protect ourselves from weakness. We do not need to protect ourselves from being rejected. We do not need to protect ourselves from being misunderstood because we understand and know in the cross that we save our lives by losing them. We find our home by being homeless. And because Jesus went outside the gates and outside the camp bearing that sign of exile and judgment, we go with him there, which means that we have the freedom to speak honestly about the coming judgment with tears in our eyes, with no fear. And we have the freedom to speak a message of mercy and of redemption, including to people that some religious people would say, why are you talking to them? Why are you around them? That doesn't fit with our expectations of what you ought to be. Our response can simply be, yeah, but I don't belong to you. I belong to Christ. The Lordship is with Christ, which means that the coming judgment, which means that the sense of exile is something that is part of my identity so that we remember what brought us here, we remember where we're going, and we are not people who bring to the world our power and our influence. We are not the people who steamroll and coerce people into doing things the way that we would have them to do it. We are crucified pilgrims marching to Mount Zion, and in our very lives, we are reenacting the sign to the rest of the world. You can do everything in your power to try to be famous, as though that will protect you. You can do everything in your power to try to be successful, as though that will give life meaning for you. And yet, at the end of it all, The only way that you will find life is through death. The only way that you will find reality is through Jesus. So we carry that message not with swagger, not with pride, but we carry that message with an exile's baggage. And that baggage is a cross on our backs. Let's pray. Lord, I pray for the men and women in this room. I pray for all of the ways that you are calling and equipping them right now. I pray for those who are scared. I pray for those who are scared right now that somehow they're not going to be able to live up to their own expectations of themselves or they're not gonna be able to live up to other people's expectations for them. Lord, would you give them a sense of freedom a sense of freedom of being loved, a sense of freedom in being called, a sense in which they understand and know they don't have to perform for you, they don't have to come before you with a list of their accomplishments or their grades or their their wins, but that they come to you through blood. And Lord, would you give them the freedom then to look to a lost and hurting world around them and to love, and to speak, and to stand. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you. Dismissed.